greetings guys, Mark Boswell, Boswell Emergency Medical. Today we're going to talk about compartment syndrome and crush injuries. And I'm going to talk about it specifically from the CEN perspective as far as um, some important points to help you be successful in the exam. Although those of you that watch and follow me from the EMS side of the fence, you should find this useful as well also. There's a seven minute slowdown caused by an accident in six miles. But anyway, so we're going to talk compartment syndrome and crush injuries um, for a few minutes. Um, not really sure how long I'm going to run this, um, but I'm going to go through the stuff that we need to know for the exam, as well as some other um, informational points for it. And consistent with the exam, I'm going to go through it from a uh, pathophysiology perspective um, to include things like the incidence and the nature. Through a patient presentation as far as signs and symptoms, physical exam findings. Then we'll go through some diagnostics that we'll use and some interventions, and then pharmacology um, as applicable. So compartment syndrome and crush injury. I put these two together because, of course, your most common cause for a compartment syndrome is probably some type of crush injury. We need to remember that we, there are also things, burns can cause compartment syndrome. Um, Things like snake bites, we talk about envenomations, our pit vipers or the coratolids. Um, not only does their venom cause bleeding coagulopathies, but also the potential for compartment syndrome with the low tissue degradation and destruction that occurs also. We can also have compartment syndrome from some medical causes, things like putting a splint on or too tight or putting a cast on before the actual injury, the, i.e. the fracture, has subsided in the swelling. Also devices like the pneumatic anti-shock garment or the military anti-shock trousers, uh, those mass pants or mass suit, whatever you want to call it, which fortunately we don't use much anymore, but they can cause a compartment syndrome type presentation also. But for the most part, the most common um, one or two we'll deal with in the emergency setting is going to be crush injuries and, um, like I said, our snake bites and possibly burns. Crush injuries are definitely the top of the list. So what body parts are most likely to be affected? Well, it's gonna be similar to which ones are most likely to get crushed. Uh, we're talking usually our extremities, okay? So, and again, the incidence goes from proximal to distal. So you get a, a lot of the lower forearm, the lower forearm, a lot of the forearm, and then also the lower leg, and then a few more higher up the arm. And into the um, upper leg compartment as well too. So in general, the most common body parts affected are going to be extremities. So we're thinking about bony injury also because a lot of times our compartment syndrome is associated with bony damage, fractures, etc. whether it be closed or open. So we have to think about things like tip, fib fractures, femur fractures, uh, radius, ulna fractures, humeral fractures are the most common. So extremities are the most common presentation. Crush injury is the most common cause. So patient physical assessment, patient findings, signs and symptoms, of course, our patient may not be responsive if it's a trauma patient. They'll obviously be complaining of some degree of pain. Now, a textbook or a, uh, a hallmark description of the pain of compartment syndrome is the phrase disproportionate pain or pain out of proportion to the injury. What does that mean? It's describing a very dramatic, a very high level pain experience of the patient as they start to experience this tissue ischemia and tissue death. Another way to quantify this is it'd be like a pain that you've already treated with, let's say, 10 of morphine over five or 10 minutes, and it's not budging the pain whatsoever. Maybe you've gone up to, you know, even 15 or 20 of morphine in the last 30 to 45 minutes, and the pain is still excruciating and severe, a legitimate 10 out of 10 pain. So pain out of proportion or disproportionate pain is our patient um, unique uh, symptom they're gonna report. Now, the progression of compartment syndrome, whatever the cause is that brought us to this point, 
it's going to progress the same in all cases. As those compartments of the lower leg or the forearm, or the upper arm or the upper leg, as those pressures start to increase, they start to compress and occlude the different circulate, circulatory or passageways through that extremity. And they're going to start obstructing the lowest flow systems first. And as the pressure continues to increase, more and more will be compromised going into the higher pressure systems. So the lowest flow system we have in an extremity is the lymphatic drainage. So with just a little bit of compartment pressure increase, the lymphatics start to be congested, and we might start to see a little bit of puffiness distal to the injury, or distal to the um, where the compartment syndrome is. As the pressure continues to increase, the next system with the next highest pressure is the venous system. So our veins start to be compressed, and then our arteries are middle of the road. So lymphatics, venous, and arterial flow in that order. Now, we've always been taught in emergency medicine, and emergency care, that whenever we lose an, a pulse, an extremity, it's an emergency. Absolutely, um, because we know that the concern for ischemia, uh, tissue uh, um, under oxygenation, potential um, tissue dysfunction, cellular derangement, and tissue death can occur when we don't have a pulse or any arterial flow anymore. However, in the setting of compartment syndrome, pressure can still accumulate beyond cessation of the arterial pulse. Our motor and our sensory nerves require the highest amount of pressure to completely obstruct and negate their flow or their transmission. So, in the order of occurrence, as that pressure starts to increase, lymphatics, venous, arterial, motor, and then sensory nerves. And the motor and sensory are about the same, about the same amount of pressure required for each. So the patient's symptoms are not just to be a cold, pulseless extremity. Eventually, when compartment syndrome is fully manifest, they're going to have true paralysis of that extremity because the motor neuron is cut off and true numbness of that extremity as the sensory nerve is cut off as well too. So it follows a progression from the lowest flow system, the lymphatics, to the veins, to the arteries, to the motor and sensory nerves. Okay. So that's basically their assessment in a nutshell. And again, I go back to that phrase I used, uh, disproportionate pain or pain out of proportion to the injury. So diagnostic-wise, things that are specific and unique in a compartment syndrome setting, of course, with crush injuries being our most common etiology for it, x-rays are going to be used quite a bit because we're going to be probably we're going to be highly suspicious for fractured bones and displacements in those extremities. So we'll be getting some x-rays. However, realize that x-ray is not going to tell us if compartment syndrome is there or not. It's just going to tell us about the integrity of the dense bone tissue. But expect to see uh, x-rays ordered on these patients also. Uh, lab testing. There's really no lab test for compartment syndrome. But we, what we want to do is keep our mind open as to what are some of the potential complications of or consequences of compartment syndrome that we might see on lab tests. With the amount of muscle tissue and soft tissue breakdown um, in compartment syndrome, we start to see the release of uh, muscle enzymes. So we might see the CK, the CKMB, or the CPK elevate on our lab test. Now this won't be diagnostic, but it is something we probably want to consider getting as a baseline um, for ongoing care for this patient. And at the time of our initial trauma care, a good idea maybe to draw those then. And so as our patients transfer it or hand it off, they can continue to trend those. Um, of course, one of the concerns with myoglobin uh, and its presence is the risk for renal function impairment. So you're probably going to see a chemistry test, a chemistry panel done also to look at a baseline butyl and creatinine. Now we don't expect our patients to go into renal failure or rhabdo immediately with crush injuries, but we need to be aware for it. So in addition to our basic lab tests on all our trauma patients, we also want to make sure to consider a chemistry panel and maybe consider one of those markers for muscle tissue breakdown. Specifically for the CEN exam, they're going to consider CK, CPK, CKMB, all those three different isoenzymes, they're going to consider them similar. There's not one that's necessarily better than the others. <clears throat> and it's going to be trauma surgeon or attending physician uh, preference 
uh, dependent on which ones they like to use. So they're all going to be considered equal for the test. Um, they won't ask you to pick one over the other. Also, you do not need to worry about reference ranges. As I say in the classes and other videos, there's only a handful of reference ranges you need to know. Every other one the exam will give you because that's not something that's going to be the exact same from facility to facility. So look at those markers for muscle tissue breakdown. Now, even though you get a chemistry panel as part of your basic assessment on a lot of these trauma patients, we want to pay special attention again to that baseline bunin creatinine because we don't want our patients that might lead to go into rhabdo. We don't want to uh, miss that. Um, if you could pick one electrolyte you'd want to look at, let's look at the potassium, okay? And it may be normal at first as the baseline, but it may be something that trends up as that muscle tissue undergoes more and more damage. And of course, the risk and the resultant hyper hyperkalemia um, that may ensue from that and the issues with that, and specifically cardiac arrhythmias. Another lab test we may do is looking at the urine uh, for myoglobin in the urine. Again, the same principle with serum myoglobin, that uh, myoglobin may spill into the urine from the muscle tissue breakdown. And that also might be an indicator that we're heading towards some degree of renal failure or rhabdo. Uh, a test question you may see as far as describing the urine, we typically use the textbook description of um, tea-colored urine, kind of a ruddy, uh, brownish-colored urine, tea meaning like iced tea-colored urine, okay? If we see that just on the urine specimen or on the Foley catheter, probably going to be suspicious there's either blood and or myoglobin in the urine, and we want to watch that. Okay, other diagnostics. So we talk about x-rays, talk about some lab tests. Again, none of those yet are specific for compartment syndrome. So how do we really tell when compartment syndrome is there or not? Of course, we maintain a high index of suspicion in these crush injuries, these uh, isolated, the isolated, <laughs> the extremity trauma, and we watch for those symptoms, the um, the progression of the pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, and paralysis, as we assess our patient. But specifically, we want to measure that compartment pressure. Okay, so let's talk about compartment pressure for a moment. The normal physiological pressure in your body for a closed space should never exceed 20 millimeters of mercury. Okay, above 20 millimeters of mercury of resistance or pressure in a closed space starts to impede the transfer of oxygenation and nutrients across the cell wall. Now, perfusion and transfer doesn't occur, doesn't stop at 21 necessarily, but it starts to be less, okay? So no one's going to consider doing a, a fasciotomy just because their compartment pressure is 21. But it does indicate to us that we need to watch that pressure because as if it continues to increase more and more and more, you get less and less perfusion and oxygenation through the tissue. Um, interesting side note that that pressure of 20, some other uh, body compartments that we use that for, um, when we look at eye or ophthalmological problems, the intraocular pressure should never exceed 20. Above 20 millimeters of mercury of intraocular pressure starts to damage or cause changes to the, um, the eye perfusion, the arterial um, vascular bed. And that's actually one of our diagnostic criteria for glaucoma, is an, eye, an intraocular pressure above 20. Another compartment is the um, intracranial compartment inside the skull. Our ICP should never be above 20. Above 20 of ICP, and if you watch other videos or if you've been in one of the classes or coming to a class, we talk about ICP. Above 20, you start to lose perfusion to the brain tissue. So again, it's defined as a closed space with a pressure of more than 20. But we're going to back up and go back to the compartment syndrome now. So we're talking about our extremities, such as our limbs. And that pressure above 20 starts to show us that compartment syndrome is there. Now, no trauma surgeon or orthopod is going to just, like I said, cut that extremity because their compartment pressure is 21 or 22. It's a very subjective range. There will not be an exam question about you know, should you do a fasciotomy at 25, at 30, at 35? That's not a fair question because it's going to be dependent upon the surgeon and what else is going on with the patient, okay? But do know the number, 20 is the maximum, okay? In other words, if they did ask a test question, 
and they let's say for example they said when would you not perform a fasciotomy after measuring the pressure it would the time to not do it is when the pressure is less than 20, okay, because compartment syndrome isn't there. So how do we measure that? Well, um, I don't have anything to show you in a second, but you can Google this if you want. Look up Stryker, S-T-R-Y-K-E-R, Stryker pressure needle. That's just one manufacturer, and it's usually the most popular one that's out there. And there's other ones that do the same thing, just different names and just constructed a little bit differently. But most was called a Stryker needle. Or the exam, if they don't want to show preference to a certain manufacturer, they're going to call it a compartment pressure monitoring needle. So basically, the physician is going to insert this needle into the space, the compartment in question, and it will give a digital readout of the amount of pressure in there. And they may take several measurements to see what the average or the trend is, and they may repeat those at frequent intervals. Okay? So that's the only true way to tell if compartment syndrome is present. Okay, is if that if it's because that pressure is high, above 20. Okay, so the question as far as moving into interventions, well, let's let's go from simple to more complex. So first line interventions for this crushed extremity, because that's usually what you're dealing with, is our first of all our local wound care. Okay, sometimes there's an open wound or a puncture wound there, you know, because maybe there's a compound fracture. Let's keep that opening sterile or as close to sterile as we can. Okay. Um, let's try not, to, let's not go on probing inside these open wounds because we may extend contamination further and the patient may be at risk for osteo. So local external wound care um, is something simple and easy to do. And remember, we always answer these questions as far as priorities and what do you do first. We always use the mindset of what's less invasive to more invasive, what's less complex or risky, what's more complex, what's less resource dependent, what's more resource dependent. So basic wound care first, okay? Of course, we'll have done our assessment. We already talked about the assessment as far as assessing the distal neurovascular, looking for those five Ps, pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesias, and paralysis. Uh, next, what we want to do is consider positioning. <clears throat> All right, current recommendations say we do, we just we want to immobilize the extremity, and if we elevate it, elevate it only slightly, just slightly, okay, because there's a drawback to either elevating it too much or to not elevate. So let's look at the logic or the thinking on this. Well, one might think, let's elevate this arm up high so we keep the pressure from accumulating in that compartment. Okay, that logic is there. However, if we've got, if we're looking at compartment syndrome possibly starting, we need to maximize perfusion to that area or trying to promote it. And elevating extremity is not going to be promoting perfusion. It's going to be exsanguinating or basically taking blood out of that extremity. So elevating it very high is not a good thing. Okay, one thinks, well, let's try and increase perfusion by putting it down and getting more arterial blood flow. So putting it in a dependent position. Again, the logic makes sense, but applying it to the patient's scenario of compartment syndrome we're dealing with too much pressure in that extremity, and putting the extremity down is going to increase that pressure even more and further accelerate that increase in pressure. So too high is not good, down too low is not good. Current recommendation is just slightly immobilize. Um, discrepancy and controversy over uh, putting ice on this to slow down the swelling, that's not going to be a test question. Different thoughts on that, there's different um, explanations for that. That will not be a test question. The simple answer is routine, basic external wound care. I'm trying to keep it clean as possible. Elevate slightly and immobilize. Okay, so those are non-invasive things we can do. So the fasciotomy then becomes an intervention that's considered. And again, we've already discussed we're not going to do a fasciotomy less than 20 millimeters of mercury. Now, what we're talking about for the CE and exam or other pre-hospital stuff, we're talking about an emergency fasciotomy, okay? There are fasciotomies done frequently in hospitals up in the operating room. These are not considered the emergency ones. We're talking about doing it in your ED or if you're under medical direction and you're an EMS provider doing it in the back of your ambulance. These are not the ideal places to do this, okay? Last, it's the last choice of something you want to do. Though these environments, the ED, back of an ambulance, they are filthy. Um, they are high risk for contamination 
anytime you do an emergency procedure versus elective procedure, it's much higher risk for complications. Um, another, another way to weigh the risks and benefits of an emergency fasciotomy, look at the rest of the patient's health history. Um, you're doing a surgical procedure in someone who's not been NPO since midnight, um, someone who's not had the benefit of their pre-op betadine or hibiclens type scrub at home before going to OR. They've not done like bowel preps. They've not got you know their affairs in order or whatever. You're doing an emergency procedure to truly save that limb because the only alternative after this, if you don't do it, in other words, that's, that's what you're saying, is if I don't do the emergency fasciotomy, then that limb is coming off, it's dead. It will not be viable at all. So it's that last intervention that can be done to try and minimize, to try and maximize the chance of limb salvage, okay? And again, you're doing it in a filthy environment, you're doing it hastily, you haven't even addressed their other injuries. Let's face it, a lot of these crush injuries, they've also got other injuries um, to their, their body as part of their trauma presentation. So we haven't even dealt with those yet. There's probably fractured bones in that extremity. Those haven't even, haven't even been dealt with yet. Um, you know, an emergency fasciotomy uh, under less than ideal circumstances, as far as environment goes, um, you're talking about making a major surgical wound that's going to require even more healthcare costs, more risk for infection, more likelihood for rehab, physical therapy. Other, there's just so many other tangibles associated with doing that that it's not something that a physician is going to do just arbitrarily like, oh, let's just have a fasciotomy today, okay? An emergency fasciotomy in the ED or the pre-hospital environment truly needs to be the last thing, the last ditch thing done before the limb is no longer salvageable or viable, okay? Because ideally, even if the pressure is going up and your orthopedics or trauma surgeons are watching the pressure and doing repair. We found a faster route every, I-40 West I don't know, 15 to 30 minutes. North, which saves they're still going to prefer to move that patient route, to the OR percent. and do it there under more ideal conditions. So for this exam, emergency fasciotomy will not be done less than 20. And it's a very rare procedure. Okay, it's truly limb or it's, it's truly to salvage the limb and prevent them from losing it. Okay. Um, the CEN exam does not go into um, how to uh, do the fasciotomy or what we need to do. Um, it's just what are the considerations for it. Okay. So fasciotomy would be the ultimate intervention for compartment syndrome. Um, drugs associated, um, there's really no specific drugs associated with this. Uh, of course, if you start looking at you know airway first, trauma patient, you might be using some RSI type drugs to secure and control the airway. Airway is always a priority in our patients, even before any pulseless um, extremities or compartment pressures that go through the roof. Airway is always a priority, so you might use some RSI drugs. Of course, you have a uh, potentially open wound with this trauma patient, a potentially an OR case, so we're doing antibiotics either empirically, meaning based on the evidence, or prophylactically to prevent OR situations with infection, um, and you know drugs of choice that your trauma surgeons use, and Ceph. Um, cephalozoan is probably one of the most common or popular ones to use. You do not need to worry about any dosages or anything. Um, of course, life-saving tetanus shot if indicated. And then, of course, pain medications for the patient too. Pain and sedation or anx anxiolytic type medicines. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go Cowboys. Um, I saw that. <laughs> um, but remember, in the, in the ultimate paradigm of things, um, medications are not the first line for this compartment syndrome. It's those basic wound care steps, um, the basic things we can do to try and maximize perfusion a bit, and then the discussion about the emergency fasciotomy and the high risk associated with that. Um, so usually drugs are kind of like one of the last things, unless you're dealing with an airway situation or when the conscious patient's having to deal with a pain response. Um, yes, ANCEF is one of the most popular ones we use for um, open wounds. Why is ANCEF a good choice? Um, and you see it used a lot for surface trauma, you know, uh, burns, crush, open wounds, things like that. Um, it's very effective. Uh, it's a first generation cephalosporin. It's very effective uh, against your most common surface pathogens, which are staph and strep. And that's usually what you're trying to prevent against. And most people are actually very tolerant to ANCEF despite all the penicillin allergies out there. So pretty safe to give.
Uh, again, dosing would be dependent upon your physician, um, physician's discretion. Also, ANSEF is not does not risk the kidneys, and we know sometimes our trauma patients have kidney issues or risk for kidney issues. So, good point there. Um, someone mentioned about the uh, the five P's here. Uh, signs and symptoms in order. Yes. Yeah. In, now, in order. Again, it depends if you have a conscious patient or not. Um, this was um, Stewart, it looks like. It depends on the patient's presentation. If they're conscious, yes, pain would probably be one of the first things you're looking at um, in that extreme, that injured extremity. But sometimes, let's face it, they're not conscious or there's an altered mental state. Um, but the symptom progression, don't focus so much on that for the exam, but look at it from a physiological perspective. Again, it goes from lowest system to highest system. So lymphatics, venous, arterial, motor sensory nerves, okay? And typically we tie in those five Ps to remind us the things that are each associated with pain, and not any particular order, but just to remember the things we're looking for, five Ps, pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, and paralysis. Um, if you had all five of those to their maximum extent, um, you could assume just uh, at bedside examination that you probably have compartment syndrome. But remember, we need to use that compartment pressure needle, also called the striker needle, to actually measure the pressure. And then, of course, 20 millimeters of mercury is something to remember for the exam, too, because that's the uh, old thing you should ever see in a compartment. Turn these little compartments here without crashing. What would a CEN question look like? Um, so basically, it would tie in a lot of the stuff I've talked to you about. It would look for the fit. Again, the CEN questions are written. They're either going to ask you about signs and symptoms, i.e. or assessments. They're going to ask you about appropriate lab tests. They're going to ask you about uh, interventions. So the things about compartment syndrome and crush that make it unique, uh, again, going back to the beginning of the video, if you weren't watching from the start, um, one is the etiology or the patho. So extremity trauma is the most common. So that might be something, they might ask you something about that in the exam. Um, the pathophysiology is that increasing pressure in an enclosed space. So, you know, what's more likely is going to be more likely a, like a forearm or a lower leg where there's not a lot of subcute tissue in those areas. Because um, even people that are more body weight, body mass endowed, our forearms, our lower legs are usually still fairly lean. There's not a lot of forgiving subcute tissue that absorbs from that pressure. So the etiology, the pathophysiology, um, again, remember that 20 millimeters of mercury, so they might ask you, you know, the physician is, um, at what point would the physician consider doing a fasciotomy? And they might throw you some numbers out there, uh, 10 millimeters of mercury, 15, 20, or 25. The only right answer to that is they would consider it at 25 because 20 or less is the normal for a compartment. Um, they might ask you about lab tests associated with compartment syndrome. Again, realizing no lab test is going to tell you about it, but you're looking for the consequences and you want to start trending these early. So CK, CPK, CKMB, uh, potassium, and maybe checking that urine for myoglobin. So that's that's how they would ask questions about that, things that are unique to it. Um, hope that helps. If I think of something else, maybe I'll write um, a compartment syndrome question or two and put it up on the daily questions I've been trying to do lately. All right, so I am on the road um, to teach class uh, Monday and Tuesday in Springfield, so I am going to have to shut off for now. I actually have to fill up some gas here soon. So if you didn't catch this all, um, YouTube, or I'm sorry, YouTube, Facebook does it that even after the live recording's done, it's um, very shortly later uploaded, and you can go back to the beginning and watch that from the start. Um, I'll, if you type comments to it, I'll still see them a bit later, and I can actually reply to them later. I'll probably be catching up with some of the comments when I get to the hotel this evening. So feel free, even though it's not live anymore in a few minutes, to go ahead and send your comments or questions. I'll try and touch base with you, okay? And uh, thanks to... Uh, where was it? Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Stuart, about the Cowboys. Yes, repping the Cowboys today. Um, yeah, totally excited. Been a fan for life. Hope you are, too. All right, I got to go. You guys be safe.
uh, I can get some gas, and um, I'll follow up with you guys on the Facebook page or in the comments below here um, when I get situated tonight. Take care. Hey, enjoy the last bit of your Thanksgiving weekend, okay? Bye.